Welcome to this uh, workshop, which uh, the title is Future Proofing Healthcare Systems Driving Multidisciplinary Care for Chronic Inflammatory Diseases. You see the short title on the screen, and um, this was the most uh, uh, developed thing. So my name is uh, Roberto Bertolini. I am um, advisor of, for public health of the Minister of Qatar nowadays, but I worked for uh, many years in WHO, a couple of decades. And I was there mostly involved in um, non-communicable diseases and environment and health. So this team is very close to my heart because, you know, anytime we were dealing with the environment and other type of exposure, we were actually addressing the concern that we have about non-communicable non disease and chronic diseases. Uh, it's um, a big pleasure to be here today and to be in a company of very distinguished panelists. So on my right hand side, you see Professor Dr. Glennis Scudding, who is a board member of the European Forum for Research and Education in Allergy and Airways Diseases. Welcome. I have also Tonya Winders, which is the president and CEO of the Global Allergy and Airways Patient Platform. And she also mother of two children with type 2 inflammatory disease, so she has also a personal experience to share with us. Uh, on the other side, I have uh, Professor Matthias Augustin, which is Director of the Institute of Health Services Research in Dermatology and Nursing of the University Medical Center in Hamburg, here in Germany. Welcome. And also Dr. Razia Pense, Director of the Department of Health Population and Non-Communicable Diseases at the WHO in uh, Geneva. Welcome, Dr. Razia. So, um, so we will uh, we will proceed this way. We will have uh, two presentations of the uh, two panelists, uh, Professor Scudding and uh, Tonya Winders. Um, we will then open uh, a dialogue and a discussion with um, uh, with the, the the panelists for a more in-depth conversation about the importance of integrated care models in uh, in the resilient health systems to deal with this um, problem and uh, particularly addressing the issue of multidisciplinary care for people with um, type 2 inflammatory diseases and during these uh, discussions we will invite the, the the audience i mean both you here and also people who are connected to us with us virtually to send questions and we will uh, ask questions both a little bit after the interventions, but also during uh, you know, the panel afterwards. So the, our uh, objective today is to discuss the um, individual and compounded burden, burden of, non of chronic inflammatory diseases, uh, such as, for instance, asthma or uh, atopic dermatitis. This on patients and on the healthcare systems as well, because this is another a, a, an important dimension in the society as well. Um, so, in um, chronic inflammatory diseases is a, is a leading cause, is probably the leading cause. Chronic disease is the leading cause of mortality and morbidity throughout the world and has a tremendous uh, cost on the health system. I'm sure many of you have um, seen uh, some years ago in 2011, there was a major report published by the World Economic Forum and other in Harvard University in which they were um, quoting the overall cost of uh, uh, non-communicable diseases uh, on the society in the world between 2010 and 2030, and they estimated this to a huge uh, number, 30, 30, 47 trillions of dollars. I had difficulties in visualizing the number because, you know, uh, yesterday I realized that it's a billion times 1,000, which is very <laughs> difficult to visualize. Um, this huge amount uh, is equivalent to approximately 2.5 trillion per year. And 2.5 trillion per year, I discovered yesterday, is actually the annual GDP of India. So it's, it's a huge amount of money that is uh, associated with these diseases, both in direct cost and indirect cost. And we are talking about, uh, you know, diseases in which there is uh, a, um, an evidence that immune system attacks healthy issues uh, healthy tissues, so like uh, in the asthma or in the atopic dermatitis or in chronic rhinosinusitis and other type of diseases. And, uh, and what is important to underline, this type of diseases that sometimes they have, they have a range of symptoms, they can be mild, but they can be also very severe, put a significant strain on the healthcare system. And, um, and we all are aware that the healthcare system, healthcare systems today is 
to nowadays have a, a number of issues uh, and problems related to the availability of resources. I mean, the, uh, the lack of human resources, the, um, the, uh, the problem of the different priorities they have to face, including, for instance, I mean, not only the pandemic that we all know, but um, also the uh, antimicrobial resistance, for instance, or problems, acute problems related to conflicts or any other uh, demand that they receive uh, on, a, on a daily basis. In addition to that, I mean, we have new challenges. In this conference, many sessions are addressing climate change and uh, environmental pollution. And environmental pollution and climate change are also associated with the exacerbation, if not causing, in some cases causing, but most cases exacerbation of chronic conditions. And this poses an additional burden. So, I mean, all of those things together uh, make us think and, uh, and understand that this is really one of the most uh, uh, pressing issues for the health system and the society in general. Um, now, um, so what we are trying to do today is try to understand a bit better which this, with this type of uh, diseases, their burden, uh, the issues that they pose to families and to society, and also to discuss how we can address them through multi disciplinary care, and also preventive, uh, preventive approaches. Now, um, before we go into the discussion and we look at the things more uh, in detail and we listen to the presentation of the two colleagues, um, we have prepared a video for uh, you to see, um, to have a, a direct uh, contact with patients who have this problem to make a little bit this experience more concrete and, uh, and real. So can we have the video, please? Cuando iba a primaria, muchas veces me dejaban de lado y mis compañeros pensaban que los podía llegar a contagiar y que se iban a enfermar. The biggest fear is that I'll have an attack someday and I'll be in a place where nobody will know what to do about me. One of the experiences I had about not being able to smell, I did not have any idea that my sweatshirt was burning until I felt the heat. Bin ich ganz schlecht zurechtgekommen, weil durch das ewige Jucken und durch das Kratzen. Und dann ist mein Mann zu mir ins Bad gekommen, hat sich auf den Boden gekniet. Dann will ich keinen Tag mehr leben, weil dann sehe ich in meinem Leben keinen Sinn mehr, weil das keine Lebensqualität mehr ist, wenn man, wenn man sowas hat. Also das ist ein furchtbares Leiden gewesen. Okay, so I think this uh, video gives us a little touch about uh, what we are talking about. I mean, sometimes, I mean, listening to the witnesses and to the experience of patients, uh, you know, translates our understanding from a theoretical type of approach to a real life uh, issue, which is, makes uh, the appreciations of the problem much uh, more concrete. Right, so um, let's go now to the uh, to listen to our panelists. I mean, uh, first of all, I, we will... Uh, uh, have the pleasure, I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Dennis uh, Scudding. She will talk about type 2 inflammatory diseases and the key findings from a U4AS recently published white paper on chronic type 2 inflammatory diseases. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. 
Thank you very much for that nice introduction. And can I say how very honored I am to be here talking on behalf of Euphoria, the European Forum for Research and Education in Allergic Type, Allergic and Allergic Type Diseases. So what are type 2 diseases? And what are the unmet needs of people who suffer from them? Well, I divide them into two groups. First group are the allergic diseases where the allergy antibody IgE is very clearly involved. These tend to start relatively early in life, in childhood or young adulthood. The IgE is clearly demonstrable in the blood or even by skin prick testing. And they include things like atopic dermatitis or infantile eczema, food allergy, anaphylaxis, asthma, allergic rhinitis. And all of these have multimorbidities, which I will explain in a minute. And the second group looks similar, but is slightly different. These tend to be later in life. Atopic dermatitis may well continue, but become more complicated. But the two diseases that are very prevalent are asthma, late onset eosinophilic asthma, and chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps, sinuses full of inflammatory eosinophilic tissue with polyps hanging down into the nose. And again, these have multimorbidities. And then somewhere in the middle are the slightly orphan conditions of eosinophilic esophagitis and of local allergic rhinitis, where the nose has allergy but the IgE is confined to the nose and not demonstrable elsewhere. Why do these conditions happen? Well, we're beginning to understand this. Their pathomechanisms are similar to the mechanism that will be used to expel invading metazoan parasites, things like helminths, and they are extremely powerful. But what seems to be provoking them is the factors acting on epithelia. The skin, the mucous membranes, the lining of the nose, the chest, the lungs, the gut. And these things acting on them are not only allergens, but other environmental factors. Microbes, viruses, bacteria, molds, smoke, pollution, PM10. And it appears to be that when the epithelial barrier fails, these can get in and cause this massive inflammatory reaction. And that barrier failure may relate to genes, such as the lack of filaggrin, or it may relate to environmental influences that dry skin and reduce the cohesion between epithelial cells. And at the bottom of the slide, you can see the two major types of immune reaction. On the left-hand side, it's the adaptive immunity with IgE driven by Th2 cells. On the right-hand side, in the older age group, more predominant is innate immunity driven by ILC2 cells and factors elaborated from the epithelium, TSLP, and various interleukins are responsible for orchestrating this. Now, these diseases have certain characteristics. They're genetic plus environmental influences, not single gene diseases, often multi-gene. And the environment seems to be playing a bigger and bigger part. When I was a child at school, and I'll leave you to imagine how long ago that was. <laughs> An asthma inhaler in a classroom was a complete rarity. These days, you would expect to have a little dish of asthma inhalers and maybe adrenaline injectors in practically every classroom in most westernized societies. So they're common. They have become more common, and that has been associated with a process of westernization. And allergic rhinitis, which was a rare disease of the upper classes 200 years ago, 
is now the commonest immunological disorder in man, affecting around 400 million people globally, and around one in four in the UK. These diseases, as you heard, they're chronic, and they are often underdiagnosed, misdiagnosed, and mistreated. They have a tendency these days to progress. At one time, people would have hay fever, allergic rhinitis in the summer, for a few years and maybe grow out of it. We don't see that pattern much anymore. They are more likely to grow into perennial rhinitis and then possibly on to asthma. There are various what we call allergic marches. Children who start with atopic dermatitis may well develop food allergy, asthma, allergic rhinitis. There's also a progression for those who start with allergic rhinitis, often as teenagers, to go on and develop asthma. And you can see in the graph on the right, the European Community Respiratory Health Survey, looking at around 8,000 young adults and noting when they developed asthma. The bottom line, adults without rhinitis, without IgE. The top red line is those with allergic rhinitis. So if you have allergic rhinitis, you are around 3.4 times more likely to develop asthma than someone without it. And there's another recognized progression, and that is from eosinophilic but non-allergic rhinitis to nasal polyps and to late onset asthma. These are nearly always multi-system diseases. They don't tend to stick to one part of the body. They have multi-morbidities which reduce quality of life, they reduce the ability to do well at work and at school, and sometimes they are fatal. They are very costly, both to individuals and to society. And I just want to show you a little bit about those multi-morbidities. My colleague, uh, Pete Smith from Brisbane, has lent me this slide. Allergic rhinitis is really the tip of the iceberg. Its symptoms are running blocking, itching, and sneezing. But the nose is the gateway to the respiratory tract. And so what happens in the nose tends to have knock-on effects on the sinuses. Sinusitis, rhinosinusitis, can follow nasal disease. It affects the throat. Adenoid hypertrophy is frequently found in children. It affects the middle ears. The eustachian tube is almost horizontal in childhood. So what goes on in the nose often has effects on the middle ear, and a lot of children get what's called glue ear and are deaf for several months of the year, and that may well be underappreciated. The eyes are affected in 50 to 70% of patients with allergic rhinitis. Very difficult if you're a surgeon. And of course, there's that tendency to involve the lower airways, either by progression to asthma or by bronchial hyperreactivity the airways become irritable, the lower airways become irritable when there is inflammation in the upper airway. And that is neurogenic. In children, there may be uh, malocclusion developing as a result of rhinitis, and the skull does not develop correctly. But probably the most significant multimorbidity and the one that is ignored is the effect on the brain. Now, next time you have a cold, just notice how difficult it is to go to sleep. If your nose is blocked, it's very hard to get a good night's sleep. And you tend to go off to sleep and you wake up and your mouth is dry and you need a glass of water. Well, if you have allergic rhinitis affecting you significantly, each night's sleep is like that. And if you don't sleep properly, you don't think properly. And if you don't think properly, you tend to go to school and work. Absenteeism is rare, but presenteeism occurs when you are there, but you are not performing to the best of your ability. And that is extremely common in these diseases. And you might say, oh, well, allergic rhinitis at least doesn't kill you. Well, the answer is that it can. There's data from Finland 
showing that if you have allergic rhinitis and you take an old-fashioned sedating antihistamine, you are four times more likely to die in a car crash than somebody with allergic rhinitis who had taken a non-sedating antihistamine. So one really important thing to remember from this lecture is never, ever take a sedating antihistamine for allergic rhinitis. And you will find those drugs on the shelves of practically every pharmacy in the world, and you will find them labelled as highly suitable for children and adults. And that is one thing that we ought to put a stop to. So just let me show you what life is like for a child with type 2. This is Sarah, she's seven. She's been troubled all her life. She had atopic dermatitis in babyhood, she's got asthma, she's got allergic rhinitis now, and she has the allergy antibody to multiple allergens in her environment. Probably the one that bothers her most is house dust mite, but she reacts to grass pollen in the summer, and she reacts to cats as well. Fortunately, she has not developed food allergy. Her asthma is present all year round. She wheezes if she forgets to take her inhaled corticosteroid. Her asthma gets much worse every time she gets a cold in the winter. There is synergy between viral infections and type 2, especially with rhinovirus, especially with rhinovirus C. And when she gets a cold, not only does her asthma get worse, but she gets glue ear and she can't hear. She sleeps poorly and her schoolwork is suffering. The other factor is that Sarah's mother has to keep taking time off work to take her to see various doctors. Because somebody looks after her skin, somebody else looks after her chest, her GP looks after everything, and she sees the ENT surgeon from time to time because of her hearing. This is very time consuming and ought not to be happening. She ought to have one single one-stop shop. And in that one-stop shop, she needs somebody as a point of reference to teach the family about what this disease is, about what factors are really important, what they can do about them, what treatment is needed, how to take it, when to take it, what side effects are possible, a contact number or at least an email address of somebody who's going to respond within 24 hours, because if not, they will go onto the internet and they will probably find advice which is not good. And they need to know about their asthma, her asthma, when she needs to increase her therapy, when things are dangerous, when she might call for help. And these days we have mobile phones with apps. This is the Mask Air app, which can be very useful individuals to follow their disease and to show their um, practitioners how they've been getting on. Perhaps we should also be thinking about something else for Sarah. Perhaps we should be trying to think how to stop more children ending up like her, or possibly how to alter the course of some of them. And various things are emerging as possible preventers. One is the early feeding of highly allergenic foods like peanut. And the group at Guy's Hospital in London have done some excellent work with the LEAP study. And the window of opportunity is early. It's around three to four months of feeding peanut in the form of peanut butter and feeding it regularly every day to reduce peanut allergy. It seems to work for egg as well. <coughs> Excuse me, I have one of these diseases. Other possibilities of probiotics. They <coughs> have not perhaps lived up to their early promise, but they are still being looked at. One other thing is what happens if we control atopic dermatitis better? I told you that sensitization can happen through the skin, and that is probably how a lot of food sensitization happens. So if we use emollients, or if we use tacrolimus or picromolulus, which is not going to damage the skin, but is now in Germany available for six months and up, will we get better results? The jury is out. Another method is allergen-specific immunotherapy. Around for over 100 years now as an injection, 
but more recently available as an under-the-tongue preparation for several very relevant allergens like grass pollen, tree pollen, house dust mite. And there is some evidence that early use of specific allergen immunotherapy can actually alter the course of disease and reduce that progression from allergic rhinitis to asthma. And on the right hand side, you can see something I think which is very interesting. Monoclonal antibodies are being made against those cytokines that I showed you that are responsible for driving this disease. And this particular one, dupilumab, is a monoclonal antibody against the receptor for IL-4 and IL-13. And this has been used very successfully in atopic dermatitis. And this meta-analysis looks at what happens after that. And you can see that there are two things that are well to the left. One is asthma and the other is IgE. So it may be that very early use of one of these admittedly highly expensive drugs might be able to alter the course of disease as well. And we live in hope. We need to have quite a lot more research done in this area. And I'm also supposed to tell you about what Euphoria has been doing. And this is some qualitative research on the patient needs. And these are patients with the type 2 inflammation of their airways and their skin. And these are adults aged 18 to 65. And they are pretty severely affected. And they've had the disease for at least five years. And they've got at least one comorbidity. So th this is the top end of the spectrum. And this is what they, they were answering. And the statements are ordered by the number of times they've been reported. And as you can see, the polyp patients, the worst thing is the lack of smell and taste. Did any of you lose your smell and taste with COVID? Yeah. Did you find it terrible? <laughs> it is difficult to know how bad it is until it happens to you. And this delicious looking plate in front of you tastes of cardboard. Yeah. <clears throat> They also have problems with blocked nose and then facial pain pressure. Asthma, the major problem is shortness of breath and of course atopic dermatitis, the skin lesions. But again on the right hand side, and all of these share the worries about corticosteroid use because many of them will end up taking oral corticosteroids for their asthma or their polyps or slathering corticosteroids on their skin for their atopic dermatitis. And then, as I told you with Sarah, they have many social problems and sleep disturbance is the worst of these. And it affects their lives in a similar way. And what do they want? Well, they want better outcomes for surgery. They want less reliance on their drugs. They don't want to have to keep taking medicines. And the AD patients want their creams reimbursed. It's a very expensive business to have to cover a lot of your body with creams all the time. And you see in the middle here, the very many problems that beset these patients that we tend to forget about, even those of us who see them. And they were asked too, what they would see as their unmet needs and what might improve them. And the healthcare system, reorganization. We're, we're, we have healthcare systems with individual specialists treating individual organs. These patients have multi system disease. They need somebody who can look after all of it an allergist, an immunologist, trained pediatrician, general medical specialist. They decry the lack of a proper therapeutic approach and they would like implementation of guidelines and pathways. They decry the lack of state-of-the-art knowledge among healthcare professionals, so we need to keep our healthcare professionals up to date, and that's one of the things Euphoria is doing. And they decry the lack of knowledge among patients, so we need to be educating patients as well. And Euphoria is trying to do a lot of this. We are having instructional videos for patients, we have frequently asked questions, we have an advisory board, and we are producing patient education manuals. And for healthcare providers, we have CME accredited courses, we have pocket guides, and we have consensus meetings about the best 
methods of care. And just to show you an example, these are some of our pocket guides for allergic rhinitis for children and for adults. And we have an algorithm, but one for children and another for adults, which covers all severities of disease and starts simply with patient education and the use of something like saline, which is cheap, easy, and reduces the need for medication by a third. And then this progresses down through the stages, secondary care, tertiary care, and it considers allergen immunotherapy. And we will have these guides for allergic rhinitis in adults, for chronic rhinosinusitis, for asthma. And we are also producing education courses, e-learning, in all of these conditions for any interested physician. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Glenis. This has been a very interesting presentation. Um, actually, I discovered that you have a number of those symptoms, but that's OK. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, you should ask how many people. Yeah, that's yeah. right. I just mean, just you put know. your hands up if you have any of these problems. OK, I do have them. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, with adult onset also. Yeah. Uh, okay, are there any pressing questions for, for Glenis, uh, you know, at this point? Otherwise, we will have a full discussion later. Okay. All right. Thank you, Glenis. And uh, I'm pleased now to give the floor to uh, Tonia, um, that uh, she will talk about the, um, the impact of type 2 inflammatory diseases, the importance of integrated care. So please, Tonia. Thank you. Dear distinguished guests and excellencies, I cannot say thank you enough on behalf of myself and the close to 1 billion patients that I represent living with allergies, asthma, eczema, and type 2 inflammatory diseases. I always like to begin when I speak to a new crowd to share my why, not just what I do, but why I do what I do. The reason I have chosen this field and stayed in this field for over 25 years is because of the fact that I am the daughter of both a mother and father living with type 2 inflammatory diseases. I am also the wife of a husband who is impacted daily by these conditions. It should have been on my dating profile. It wasn't. I'm also the mother of five young adults living with these conditions everything from mild to moderate seasonal allergies to very moderate to severe atopic dermatitis and asthma. So this is my life. But the reason why I'm so committed to this space actually is because of the hope of the next generation. Last year, I became a grandmother and my new grandson in his first year of life is already demonstrating signs of type 2 inflammation. And that frightens me. But it also gives me hope, hope that we are moving toward future-proofed healthcare systems that can truly meet the needs of the millions, if not billion, living with these conditions. So who is GAP, the Global Allergy and Airways Patient Platform? We are comprised of 85 member organizations all over the world um, serving patients with atopic, inflammatory, as well as respiratory diseases. And again, we are called to not only love these individuals and support them through their patient journey as patient advocates, but it is that love and compassion for these individuals which is driving us daily towards action to actually change the policies and the healthcare systems that currently today are not meeting their overall needs. So when we look at future proofing of healthcare systems, we have to ask the question, what is sustainable development? How do we get to this point where the needs of the present don't compromise that ability of future generations to meet their needs? And this is that intersection of this Venn diagram here of social, environmental, and economic factors. That intersection is that sustainable development portion. But it's also about the definition of value. Now, over the last two days, we've heard a great deal about value in healthcare and how that is defined. And we know that we need to increase value while improving health outcomes and reducing cost overall. So how do we, for those living with type 2 inflammatory diseases, ensure that we have better outcomes, 
but also reduce the economic, social, and environmental cost that they are incurring. And this really leads us to what I call the triple bottom line. Um, how do we, again, have that sustainable commissioning about all of the improvement of economic, environmental, and social impact on healthcare? These three factors collectively are often referred to as the triple bottom line. And we've heard this throughout, again, the World Health Summit of ideas around the quadruple aim and the triple bottom line. But in the case of chronic respiratory disease, chronic diseases as a whole, we know that investment is the key. It's not just focusing on the cost, it's reframing that towards an investment. Because one dollar invested in prevention of these diseases yields a $7 return on investment. And yet, again, as I go, go throughout the world, as I look at my own system in the United States, it's rather bleak at times, right? Because our systems are broken. This is a, a graph that shows health expenditures as a percentage of GDP in selected countries in 2020. And we can see that all of these countries are exceeding that 10% GDP mark in healthcare expenditures, uh, none worse than the United States at almost 18%. So again, we have a broken system. We know that we are on the brink of a global recession and that inflation is at a significant high that is impacting families just like mine, just like yours every day on how to access health and how to ensure that the health that they need is, is accessible. And this slide actually shows from a recent study the six most concerning areas specifically in the US system. Things like failures of care delivery, failure of care coordination, which we've already heard. I know in my own case, my children uh, at times have had three or four different providers seeing them for their type two inflammatory diseases. None of them talking to one another, none of them integrating care. And so that lack of care coordination is causing great uh, over expense to our systems. Over treatment, as well as administrative complexity, pricing failures and fraud and abuse. And this is one of the things as patient advocates that we continue to speak out about, making sure that patients know what good quality care actually looks like and where to go to find that, the questions to ask, how to determine if they're getting the level of care that they best deserve. But let's turn from that focus of treatment and management alone towards a greater focus of living well. And how do we do that? It is oftentimes moving into that space of prevention and early intervention that we've already heard about in type two diseases. So again, with my grandson, the feeding guidelines are completely different than what they were with my own children and certainly than what my mom faced when she was first feeding me. And so can we interrupt this type two inflammatory disease in the first five years of life, I think the science is getting closer and closer every day as we move forward. And it really does become thinking about this from a life course approach. So starting in pregnancy and moving all the way from cradle to grave, instead of looking at isolated conditions and an isolated point in one's life, why not look at the course of their life and again, begin very early, even in utero, and thinking about how we prevent these diseases. That is how we will actually get to a more sustainable healthcare system, where we have the health of the population and the healthcare cost in a more balanced fashion that is, again, considering those three factors of economic, environmental, and social determinants. Now, none of us can sit here and, and not be impacted or think about the way that life has changed in the last two years. And this slide, I think, reinforces what we've seen in the US in regard to how patient behavior is changing in, in, in accessing care. We know that 25 million people are now more likely to switch providers than they were pre-COVID pandemic. We also know that they're thinking more as consumers and they want a multi-touch digitally enabled experience that they are willing to shop for. They want that convenience. They want that cost effectiveness and they are willing to shop around rather than be as brand loyal as perhaps they once were. 
27% of the people surveyed have actually tried telehealth for the very first time over the last two years. And I'm sure many of you online as well as here in the room can relate to that. Uh, before the pandemic, most of us had not had the privilege of doing a telehealth visit. And now for many, it's become second nature. And those who are managing chronic conditions like asthma, eczema, nasal polyposis, um, they are more eager to embrace and see the value in new technology. We know that 74% of first-time health telehealth users are saying that they're willing to share their information, even their genetic profiling, if it helps to advance the science and better understand these chronic conditions. And then we know that, again, especially in the U.S., we're seeing this movement towards a consumer-oriented, consumer-centered model where people can shop for options when it comes to health care. And I know that may be uncomfortable. And, and especially in a country where we don't have universal health care, it is a shame that it creates a greater divide between the haves and the have-nots, those who can afford quality health care versus those who cannot. So again, let's take a look at a little bit deeper into some of these different characteristics. In the under 44-year-old uh, age group in the US, we, we are considering these new healthcare shoppers, right? So they are more suburban. Uh, they are 44 and under. And, and quite honestly, they are, are more likely to go to a provider's website. They're more likely to use digital health monitors, remote patient monitoring. In asthma specifically, we have an onslaught of people who are coming to our telehealth program and our digital health program for remote monitoring with spirometry and saying, I want to do this from the convenience of my home with an asthma coach in conjunction with my doctor rather than just relying solely on that source. And so I think that, again, that younger, under 45 group is definitely embracing this full speed ahead. Now, what about those first timers, the over 45 group, which I happen to be a part of? Um, you know, I, I think that here we have seen that, again, these pa patients are managing ongoing conditions, right? We heard already they're living with two or three comorbid conditions. Oftentimes, so many of us who have asthma also have allergies. We also have atopic dermatitis. You know, we may be managing two or three different things at once. And so again, they're willing to try those more um, um, innovative, creative approaches to care delivery, but they want a one-stop shop. They want that ability to have a medical home that is easy to access and, and again, where that relationship can be fostered. And at the end of the day, it really comes down to we are people not patients, right? None of us want to be referred to as our disease or defined by our disease. We want to be defined as mothers, daughters, sisters, friends, grandmas, lollies, that's my name. Um, and, and we don't want to be defined by our disease. So how do we deliver that personalized patient-centered experience of the future? It is by looking at the whole person. It is by thinking about the sleep disturbance that Glennis has already spoken about, the presenteeism and the way this impacts school and work attendance. There are so many things that, again, in managing chronic diseases like these type 2 inflammatory diseases need to be considered in that personalized patient-centered experience of the future. So as I conclude on the patient experience, I want to just reinforce a few things. First, when I look across the globe working with 85 organizations in these inflammatory and respiratory conditions, all of the models have some degree of brokenness. Most of the models are unsustainable and ready to be fully broken at any point in time with the burden that we have experienced over the last two years. Now is the time for change. We will never get a moment in time like we have now to rethink the way that healthcare is delivered, to future proof our healthcare systems for the next generation and for generations to come. Patients want personalized care. They need this. We know that, again, in this period of time, we're facing a climate crisis that's producing longer, stronger pollen seasons, that we have a new rising burden of illness and prevalence of these individuals living with type 2 inflammatory diseases, and that, again, we also are facing tremendous political unrest, economic recession, but we should never waste a crisis. 
Over the last two years, if this has taught us anything, it should have taught us that, uh, again, we together can come together and actually find unique solutions to future-proofing our healthcare systems and to making them more sustainable for future generations. It's time to focus on investment rather than cost. It's time to change our mindset from a fixed mindset to a growth mindset and move towards global solidarity. It will take courage to make the right decisions, but this is what patients want. They want to be active parts of their healthcare decision-making process. They want that shared decision-making model moving from a paternalistic authoritative system to a more shared, balanced way of making those decisions. Many patients want that digital health and telehealth, the use of technology, but we also know we need personal touch. It is when we have touch plus technology that it truly makes the greatest positive impact. We need accelerated innovation in this space, and we need systems that allow access to that innovation rather than hinder that innovation. We need to share data more effectively in order, again, to accelerate the learnings, to have more artificial intelligence and mobile applications like Glennis was speaking about that really will make a difference for those living with type 2 inflammatory diseases. And at the end of the day, we need evidence-based quality care for all. We've heard throughout the World Health Summit the importance of universal health coverage, and I can't stress this enough. Health is a human right, not a privilege. And it is when we come together and stop thinking about how we do this and start thinking about who we need to do this. The who's in this room, the who's across the world who are watching. There are 6,000 global public health providers and stakeholders involved in the World Health Summit over these last three days. I believe that together we can make a difference for these patients living with type 2 inflammatory diseases and future proof the healthcare systems for tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tonya, for your very um, interesting presentation with a lot of um, intellectual um, stimuli, I would say. Actually, I have a number of comments, but uh, I don't know if you, some of you would like to ask uh, questions to the, to Tonya for at this point. Okay, I see a question there. Yes. Uh, thank you for this very inspiring talk. Um, my question is, we know that in a lot of diseases where genetics is a factor, we have a databases for genetic prevalence. Um, is there an approach for global database to get better personalized treatment based on the specific person's genetic profile? Yes, so wonderful question. And I think that we, unfortunately, I don't know that there is one universal global database today that is gathering that data, analyzing it, and moving it forward. But we have had some transatlantic partnerships that I've seen where we're sharing data, specifically in severe asthma, for example. Um, the precise severe asthma network and the UBIOPRED uh, um, as severe asthma network in the, in the UK uh, are working together to look at those data and analyze them collectively. Collectively. So I think these are great examples of ways that we can begin to use data in a more powerful way to predict, prevent, and treat and manage chronic disease. Okay. Um, I would like to encourage also the colleagues which are linked to the, uh, to the web to, in, to, to ask questions through the application that I will uh, report to the speakers. Thank you, Tonya. And um, we go to the uh, panel discussion now. Um, so I think uh, I would like to ask uh, uh, Razia, for, first of all. Um, I mean, Tonya also was mentioning the issue of sustainable development. She mentioned, uh, uh, and also Glennis mentioned the environmental uh, condition. And, uh, and I think this is one of the components of the, uh, of the context within which this uh, disease developed that needs to be taken fully into account. So, can you elaborate a little bit on this, uh, Razia? I mean, what is uh, the impact of the global environment and the climate on these uh, particular diseases? Thank you very much. 
Good morning, everyone. And indeed, it's a pleasure and an honor to be all with all of you. The two presentations that we heard were very um, illuminating, stimulating, with a lot of personal uh, anecdotes, as well as experiences. Now, the question that uh, Roberta has asked about the current global climate, if we look at it, but just before that, if we look at inflammation, it is a defense mechanism of the body to fight external threats. And when we talk about chronic inflammatory disease is that when this inflammation continues, but generally it happens that the inflammatory response is mounted, it does its job and then it, it reverts back and that's normal. But when we look at sustained chronic inflammation, that's where diseases happen. Now, how does, so the, we have heard from the previous speakers that the stressors, the allergens, they are increasing because of the social factors, because of the environment factors. And uh, <clears throat> so um, we also, we are now currently in the pandemic. We are not yet out of it. And if we look at the social environment and lifestyle modifiers, they have been increasing over the period of time. And so if we look at a data point, we have 621 million reported cases as of 12th October of COVID-19, and we have six and a half million deaths. Now, data show that 60 to 90 percent of this COVID-19 mortality is in people living with chronic diseases, and that includes people living with type 2 diseases. The thing is, we do not have a disaggregation. But we definitely know that people living with chronic diseases are impacted directly as well as indirectly. Directly because you have more severe disease and increased mortality. Indirectly because of disruptions in essential services, because of chronic containment measures, and because of uh, the services being blocked as well as people unable to move and people not willing to go to the health centers because of the increased vulnerability to catching the, the COVID-19 infection. So the other thing that is facing us, which is a bigger one, is the climate change. So we've heard from previous speakers on climate change, the environment determinants, especially air pollution. So there's 7 million deaths every year, which is more than what we have seen through the COVID-19 pandemic, which is air pollution alone. And most of these deaths are related to chronic diseases. So it's important to see that the current situation, so climate change, air pollution, current pandemic. The other thing is the rapid urbanization. So there are estimates that by 2015, 2055, zero, two third of the global population will be living in cities. Now, if you look at the surface area, Cities constitute only 2% of the Earth's surface, and we will have two-thirds of the population living in cities. That will lend itself to overcrowding, poor living conditions, more dis social disturbances, and the volume of uh, exposure per purse per capita is only going to increase. So really, when we look at sustainable development, we really have to put all these factors in, into perspective that as we move forward, we are still in the pandemic, but as we pave our way out of the pandemic, we need to look at all these things, take this into consideration. And what is also important to note is that not only COVID-19, we look at any disasters, be it human-made or natural, impact of natural diseases is far more, uh, natural disasters is more on people who are most vulnerable, who are marginalized, and that includes people living with chronic diseases. So it's important that when we have the preparedness and the response systems that we need to keep people in at the center. And we have heard from previous speakers about the fractured responses, even in peacetime, that it is about the disease. What is the symptoms you present with? It's not the person. The person may have multiple systems, symptoms, but the services are organized based on the symptoms and not keeping the person at the center. So it's important just to um, close that if we look at the numbers, we've heard about 400 million people suffering type 2 inflammatory disease. 
in terms of non-communicable diseases, the number I think, so it's 25% people living with hypertension, 10% with diabetes, 41 million deaths every year, 18 million premature deaths. It's one death every two seconds. By the time we finish with the panel, I think so how many people would have lost their lives? The case for investment is there. $1 will yield a return of $7. So I think so we really need to focus on people-centeredness, on investment in health, and as we future-proof our health systems, it's important to keep people at the center, to look at solidarity, equity, and to leave no one behind. That would be true sustainable development. Thank you. Thank you, Razia. Um, I think uh, you pointed out this uh, issue of uh, prevention on sustainable development, environmental condition. I think it's something that is also relevant for what uh, Tonya was saying. Um, that I think we, I would like to develop a little bit more this, this discussion later on. But in the meantime, I would like to ask Augustine that uh, you mentioned about the care. I mean, uh, Razia, I mean, the importance of uh, people-centered care and so forth. So Augustine, in, with respect to your, Matthias, sorry, with respect to your uh, experience uh, in, the, in, in the research uh, in, the, in this area, what do you think are good indicators for, uh, you know, for qualifying quality of care for this type of diseases? Mm. Well, in fact, uh, we have indicators and we should apply them. Uh, in my country, in Germany, uh, we did large scale national surveys on the quality of care for type 2 inflammatory diseases. And uh, we developed uh, those indicators in conjointly with the patient organizations and uh, with the guideline authors. And so this set of uh, indicators needs to reflect a broad range of uh, uh, healthcare goals that we have and first the goals need to be set then the indicators to be defined and these the overall uh, the overarching goal of course is to gain a maximum of value uh, for the patients following a people-centered healthcare approach and these values um, should not be mistaken as what, what you present actually um, in, in your uh, excellent presentation mrs winders um, some economists define values as outcomes per costs. I strongly um, challenge this because this would mean the cheaper, the more value, but value in fact is anything meaningful to the patient or the people that is uh, provided in healthcare. It's independent from the costs in, by itself, I, I would say, and probably you share this with me. And so uh, we uh, try to understand uh, what uh, goals uh, follow the value that we want to create. And a part of this is a reduction in disease activity. And so uh, indicators could mean uh, that we measure and we do so uh, the degree of uh, skin involvement in atopic dermatitis and other clinical in, uh, indicators. But the more important ones are the patient reported indicators like the quality of life gained. And we particularly measure uh, well-being. This is something probably quite new in the field of type 2 diseases uh, that uh, we uh, understand uh, our healthcare goals as reaching a maximum of well-being as actually defined by WHO since 1948. And so following this, uh, we have a set of indicators that all need to fit if we measure health on a large scale in type 2 inflammation, but also on a single patient. And we have introduced this in, in healthcare uh, in general, that we start measuring patient needs uh, and uh, patient burden with those indicators, which are quite valid and also predictive for the long-term outcome, and then follow up and as how much these patient needs, uh, the goals have been reached. Oh, thank you, Matthias. Uh, can, I, can I ask you to be a little bit more specific? I mean, you're talking about quality of life and well-being. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you measure only the subjective um, report to the patients in, on this, or you also have some, let's say, objective measures that can somehow contribute to this? Uh, it's a good question. Of course, both, and, and they may make up the whole um, uh, finding or the whole status. Uh, and we are used to have the objective for decades, but, but the, the subjective component has not been taken serious uh, by many healthcare professionals and in many countries. So uh, the new one is not to measure objectively the disease status, uh, functional status, 
uh, but uh, what is behind this. And then we see there are large disparities in that, and uh, we cannot even predict in atopic dermatitis the patient uh, well-being and, uh, and quality of life by what we see. So mm. uh, we have a big gap if we don't ask the patient and then share both perspectives. I, I think this is not new to the people here, but if you want to not uh, know this, but introduce this into healthcare, you need large programs, you need to provide evidence by evidence study and uh, just to um, uh, make proof uh, that uh, this holistic view is uh, also better in terms of outcome. And we are in the process, but at the moment, uh, for example, in all registries that we drive nationwide in all clinical care settings, uh, the, uh, the inclusion of patient reported outcomes is a must now. It's imperative and the results, uh, uh, if we look at the overall health care uh, performance, is much better if you do so. So basically the patient is the, the opinion of the patient, uh, the, the, what, uh, the, the, the quality of life uh, as perceived by the patient is becoming the indicator of, uh, of uh, reference. Right. It's an indicator and the driving pathway is uh, the patient needs which are identified at the beginning. And mm -hmm. uh, th th this follows this, um, what we have heard uh, from uh, Mrs. Winders, uh, the, the concept of shared decision making, which mm -hmm. is much more sustainable than, than just an imperative, uh, uh, patriarchistic uh, um, way of deciding, of course. Okay. And also more cost effective, I might add. The data has shown Absolutely. more cost okay. This is actually very interesting because, I mean, this type of indicators can apply to a range of diseases and problems. I mean, uh, uh, that might be, mm. uh, you know, seen under a different light if you look at this uh, under this point of view. Um, Glenis, I mean, I just wanted to come back to you. And uh, you were talking about uh, a number of measures, uh, uh, a new evidence coming, uh, new potential preventive tools, both at the individual level and the uh, societal level. I mean, can you expand a little bit the issue in terms of prevention? Yes, thank you. These type 2 inflammatory diseases largely seem to relate to what is now being called the Anthropocene. They suddenly took a remarkable increase in prevalence around the middle of the last century when man began to dominate what is happening on this planet. So what happens if you have a not quite Anthropocene lifestyle? And it turns out that if you live on a farm, in Germany or Austria, especially if you live above the cattle and you get exposed, you get taken when your mother is milking, you get taken in your little um, bouncy chair into that environment, you are far, far less likely to develop aller allergies. And we also see this with the Hutterites and the Amish in the USA. But we can't, unfortunately, all live like that maybe we can extract something from that environment and Eric on Mutius has been trying to extract dust articles from dust that might replicate that preventative effect it may be that the organisms in that environment which cause our microbiome will reduce allergies if we can find the right ones and probiotics are being tried with some success, Isolari initially had some lovely success in reducing atopic dermatitis in Finland, initially with lactobacilli. Later, the experiments have become less successful, but there is a nice overview recently, and we're beginning to understand that you need really high levels and a really mixed bag of variety of microorganisms, and that may be a possibility. And then, of course, we have the other sorts of measures I mentioned, and Tonya mentioned, like early feeding of highly allergenic foods, which completely reverses what we were being taught to do ten, even 10 years ago, or five years ago. And that does seem to be effective in preventing the development of food allergy. Oh, sorry, sorry. I mean, I, know, I, I mean, I was saying something, but I stopped. <laughs> I, I just want to say that allergen-specific immunotherapy is something else that I feel we should be using at a much earlier stage. And were I to have uh, any more children, which seems a little unlikely now, and they became allergic early on, 
I will be very keen to try and switch off that allergy with allergen specific immunotherapy. And now it can be done with tablets under the tongue. It is not um, a terrible thing for children with lots of injections. First dose under supervision, repeated doses at home. What is needed, of course, is very careful monitoring and encouragement. It's not simple, but it can be done. And we need trials of this going on, I think, especially with house dust mite, which would be a very useful way of, I think, stopping a lot of allergic disease progression. Thank you. Thank you, Glenis. So, I mean, the lesson is don't clean too much. I mean, just uh, <laughs> leave it. <laughs> uh, all right. So, um, um, Tonya, I, I was very much intrigued by something uh, that you said, and also Matthias was uh, mentioning before, this shared decision making. I want to be, uh, it's also David's advocate. I mean, shared decision making means that the patients, I mean, discuss with the doctors, I mean, the, the possible, let's say, uh, options for treatment, right? I mean, and also discuss with them. But I am a bit uh, concerned about the role of the internet, the media, the social media. Mm. Uh, you know, we are seeing now patients going to the doctors and asking a therapy that they have seen uh, in, uh, you know, in a conversation in, uh, in uh, Twitter or uh, in uh, Facebook or whatever. So don't you think that this, uh, I mean, this expression, this shared decision making might, in, you know, imply some risk of uh, let's say, of moving the attention from a consolidated scientific knowledge to a sort of a popular uh, opinion which is coming out of these uh, very um, controversial uh, social media tools. Sure. Thank you for that question. Maybe, uh, Matthias, yeah. you can no, say yeah. something. Maybe, after. Thank you for yes, yes. Sure, thank you. So I think that shared decision making always begins with a very important question. What matters most to you when managing this disease or, or these, you know, set of, of conditions. And when we ask that question, it typically takes us down a completely different path than that, than that historical authoritative, you have this, I'm telling you to do this, now go forth and do it. And that's why we have such high non-adherence, non-compliance rates is because patients weren't bought in to begin with. So how do we start the conversation differently at the very beginning, recognizing that my goal may be different than your goal or anyone else's in the room? Secondly, I think that true shared decision making is offering the options, but also presenting the risk and benefits to, of those options in a fair, unbiased, balanced way to patients. So even if they do come in with that perhaps less than credible social media uh, bias, that you as the expert have that opportunity to discuss that openly mm -hmm. and to help sway them towards a more credible alternative treatment option. But I, I really believe that sheer decision-making, as I've studied it, as we've developed co-developed tools with professional societies um, across the US and the world, it, it, it is the way to ensure that we at least start with the shared goal because most of the time now in those interactions with the patients, we aren't on the same page when the patient walks out the door. Mm -hmm. No, I understand that, but I mean, maybe, Matthias, do you have a... Yeah, actually, I, um, I can sort of support what you said already, uh, but uh, add that I, working in practice with patients, uh, leave the patient the choice whether to have a certain degree of sharing or not, because some don't want, others exactly. do. And this is the first to enter, besides of the question, what is important to you, which we also yeah. ask. Yeah. Yes. And uh, then um, it's a learning, it's a process uh, of learning. And it's for sure that we want the patient to become the expert of his, her disease, and us being the experts of the treatment. But uh, this uh, needs to be uh, combined uh, then. And um, there's a lot of literature on this showing that in, in this process of gaining more participation along the course of treatment, uh, patients uh, get more satisfaction, more engagement, and uh, also be better outcomes. And this is what I can truly say for atopic dermatitis. So with the level of um, engagement of the patient, uh, the, the outcomes are better because it means that there is more adherence, a shared decision for what is to be done, adherence to preventive measures, uh, to uh, the topical treatment that is needed many, and uh, overall the outcome is better. But 
to be fair, some uh, patients, uh, they just say, uh, tell me what I should do and, and then it's fine. This yeah. is also a decision. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh, finally, uh, this all leads uh, to the question, how much uh, interference is with uh, the uh, digital media? This was part of your, your, your point. Yeah. And uh, I would say I I'm happy about all misconceptions, all things uh, uh, the patients bring to me into practice because I can take them up and um, uh, discuss this. So even if they just Google before, there's a certain level of alert awareness or, or uh, interest uh, on the patient side that I can take up and make the better out of it. So I like patients who Google a lot more than those who, who neglect any uh, information they could yeah. get. Yeah, but the, the, the crucial question is the trust that the patient has on the healthcare provider. I mean, if there yeah, is trust, much more. Uh, then they can, they can, you know, can listen to you. And also, I think what you said, I mean, this uh, uh, capacity of listening to the patient in such a way that you understand whether the guy wants or not a directive, I mean, a response or wants to participate more. So I, in my small experience of pediatrician many years ago, I remember that, I mean, when dealing with the uh, parents, I mean, in some cases, they really, I, I needed to say, you have to do this full stop. In other cases, I had to explain, you know, why you're doing this and so forth. And, you know, it, in different contexts, you need to have a different strategy. Right. So mm -hmm. I just want to point this out because, you know, sometimes these expressions that we use in conferences, in discussions, become absolute values. It's not an absolute values. I mean, shared decision making is a principle, but then you have to adapt to the different circumstances. I mean, so that's uh, something I wanted to point out. I have three questions here from the um, uh, from the colleagues uh, connected virtually. Uh, I would like to ask one of these, I think is uh, for uh, uh, Razia. He um, says, we know that climate change will affect the occurrence of bioallergens in Europe. How, from your point of view, could we act best from a preventive policy, of view, policy point of view, inform healthcare, inform patients? Thank you. So what do you think, Razia? So I think so climate change is, I think we are in a climate emergency, as the Secretary General says, it has already happened. And uh, what we do now, we have to do it in such a way that it is within the planetary boundaries and important the power of data and decision making. And we've heard from Tanya how it's important that we have that data, we share that data and to have that preven prevention actions, prevention measures. So things like, as I said, if more urbanization is happening, we can't stop people moving to cities, but how to make the cities more livable, more safer places. And if there are an identifying, you know, empowering people with the information, the health literacy, that if you have these symptoms, this is it, what, which is what, giving them options, what is good for you, what is not good for you. And then having that enabling policy decisions and legislations that allows people to make that informed choice and for that, investments are needed. That requires really upstream action so that we can see the downstream outcomes that we would want to see. Thank so you. informing both patients, informing healthcare providers, and also you know, uh, acting uh, as citizens to try to address the climate Absolutely. challenge. And there is another question here. Um, maybe I think uh, for, um, uh, for you, um, um, from you, Tonya. So uh, it says, um, Ambrin Molitor says, I, lo I love the concept of personalized asthma coach alongside the provider. Are there examples of partnership that are doing this well in sharing the data and solving the problem of the patient together? Maybe also Matthias may say something. Like that. Yes, yes. So in asthma specifically, we have a program where we have gone into high risk communities, poor socioeconomic communities, where we know that chronic respiratory disease, asthma, COPD, and others are more uncontrolled and actually done lung health screenings during the pandemic. And so we supported them with COVID vaccine and answering the myths, addressing the myths and misperceptions around COVID, but also did basic lung health screening with validated questionnaires. And then enrolling those high-risk patients, those with uncontrolled asthma or COPD, in a six-week telehealth digital health program, where we had an asthma coach who checked in on them once a week. This was a respiratory therapist, a physiologist, respiratory physiologist, or a certified asthma educator nurse in the US. 
Uh, and then we also had digital home monitoring of spirometry, pulse oximetry, and nighttime symptoms. And we had all of this in a single dashboard that the coach prepared and looked at before with uh, the data that was coming from the mobile application of the patient. And then each week they set a new goal and work towards achieving that goal. So it is that tech plus touch solution that I was speaking about earlier that I think is really helping us in those most high risk communities. And yes, it's significant investment, but it's investment in the right area because we know that that's where 80% of the cost are in that uncontrolled uh, mm. population. Matthias, do you want I, to add something? Yes, I can support this uh, in terms of atopic dermatitis. Uh, we also did randomized controlled trials on educational programs, six hours or eight hours, and uh, it uh, came out that both in children uh, with their parents in uh, adolescents and also in adults, uh, there is a significant benefit from this, both related to clinical outcomes, quality of life, uh, and uh, the, the costs, and for each euro you pay, you get two euros back in those educational programs. These were pro programs in presence, and now, supported by the German ministry, which is not far from here. Uh, we uh, now extend this to a, a, a digital version, which is uh, then uh, web-based. Uh, and in pre-studies, we got the same results. So you can also do this in a virtual way. And the, the predictive point is uh, that you have a, a shared goal when starting and uh, that you have just a, a participation of, of uh, the the participants, uh, though the atopic dermatitis program is a bit different, it focuses a bit more on social interaction because, as you may uh, guess, um, those patients with severe atopic dermatitis have a lot of issues with social interaction, stigmatization, mm -hmm. which obviously is not such a problem in uh, rhinitis and asthma. Okay. There's another question here that I, it, I think is from Glenis that you're coming from a patient organization. So says how far health information data can be accessed by the patient. I mean, maybe this is different from different countries in different contexts. Maybe you can give some examples. Yes, I, I think um, <clears throat> patients can find out information, of course, from uh, proper sources, such as the NHS in the UK, and they will get sensible answers. But of course, they can also access all sorts of other things, including something like TikTok, yeah. where <clears throat> you will get all sorts of very wacky people giving you advice about what not to eat, what to eat. And they are, most of them, not in a position to evaluate that information. Mm -hmm. And at Euphoria, we have recently done a study about patients getting information from the internet and how very misleading that can be. Yeah. And we will put it on Euphoria TV shortly. Vibeka Baka is going to be talking about that on Euphoria TV shortly. That's a very important point again. I mean, on this issue, I'm very, you want to say something? Yes, I wanted to say just in response to that, I believe that this is one of the key areas of patient advocacy organizations um, to help if individuals living with these conditions sparse out the credible versus, you know, less than credible <laughs> sources. We are focused on spreading awareness around these diseases. We've got a new campaign on COPD called Speak Up for COPD that is launching here with World COPD Day um, later this month. And, and those type of awareness days and education initiatives really are vitally mm -hmm. important to helping mm -hmm. patients understand their disease and be a more active shared participant. I also think that in the regard of advocacy, I, I, I really appreciate the comments that were made in, re, in, in respect of thinking about that we are citizens. We do have the right and the responsibility of voting and ensuring that we're also holding our policymakers accountable to future proofing our healthcare systems. So how are we doing that? What are the steps we're taking? Patient advocates are training the, the community on how to do that more effectively, how to advocate for these chronic diseases as well. And we're partnering with organizations like the ERS and Global Allergy Airways Patient Platform on the International Respiratory Coalition to actually effect that policy change. Lenny, you have a point? Yes, one thing we haven't mentioned that I think is vitally important is the item of multidisciplinary clinics. When I set up as a consultant, I had my pediatric clinic with an ENT surgeon, I'm the allergist, we had a pediatric dietitian, we had a skin specialist, and this was a one-stop shop 
for the family and the child or the children. And we could, they could see whoever they needed, and we had a nurse who was then their point of contact, and they could come back when they needed to, they can talk to the nurse and be seen again when they needed to. And these days that would probably be by telemedicine yes. rather than by an actual visit. And that way you make the child's life better, you make the parent's life better, and you make sure that everyone knows what is happening to that child because you're all in the same place seeing them and the GP gets one communication with everything in it. And in adults with that second phase of allergic type disease, it is also hugely important. Many of these people get bounced from their ENT surgeon to their chest physician and back. And the two often fail to communicate very effectively. At my hospital, the Royal National Throat, Nose and Ear, for many years, we've had a joint clinic with myself and an ENT surgeon. We've worked together. Sometimes we'd see the patients together. Often we'd, we'd see them separately, but on the same day. And we would know exactly what we were doing. And we would give them a strategy which worked well, not only for their nose, but also for their chest, and one that was not likely to do them harm. Oh, and I think we need far more multidisciplinary clinics. That's very interesting. A any question here from the audience? Yes, there is more, one question there. Can you give the microphone? While we're waiting on the mic, one thing oh, yeah, about you, multidisciplinary teams, we are uh, doing a research project now about understanding healthcare providers and their understanding of type 2 diseases. Because so many times, healthcare providers across the world have not heard this story of how these diseases connect. So, mm -hmm. GAP is actually currently doing a patient and healthcare provider um, survey across 10 countries to assess the perceptions, beliefs, and behaviors. Thank you, Diane. Please. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for a very comprehensive and informative presentation. I'm Borko Bajic, medical doctor, uh, specialized in public health. I work in Institute of Public Health in my country. An institute, like other institutes in the country, are in position to influence the strategic documents. I have many questions, but I will, uh, by the sake of time, condensate it in two questions. One is for uh, Dr. Uh, Glanis. Uh, it is related to uh, what we saw, uh, the some uh, articles showing that uh, uh, in early child development from four to six months, if you uh, uh, expose them to peanut butter or from uh, egg protein, it could benefit in a, a later stage in development of uh, type 2 allergic uh, disorders. But um, uh, how uh, uh, can we implement that in everyday life, in the practice, for instance, uh, if there is a pediatrics in the ground and he come back and work in his office, it is not in the public uh, recommendations. Uh, and we know there is a discrepancies among even UN agencies, for instance, regarding exclusive breastfeeding between uh, WHO, mm -hmm. UNICEF, mm -hmm. European mm -hmm. Pediatric mm -hmm. Association. So uh, which is the level when uh, pediatrics can say, OK, I'm here uh, and uh, 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 one who can uh, step out of uh, okay. protocols and could, could give the advice. Thank you. Uh, should I ask the second question? Or yes, wait? but brief, because we have a little okay. time. Uh, second question is, whoever wants to take it from the uh, public, it is on uh, development of health system. Uh, we know, uh, like, a uh, small country, we have to align our strategic documents with the strategic development agenda, European uh, WHO plan of work, uh, global plan of work, Western Balkans, uh, and we uh, know what are the key, uh, key guiding principles. But uh, what we are hearing here uh, today is a patient-centered. It's always in, in all of these documents. But what are we talking here about? Integration, uh, horizontal integration of, of primary health care or vertical integration with secondary health care? Or we are, as uh, Dr. Glenn has said, uh, organizing specialized centers and not providing some level of care in uh, okay. uh, hospitals All right, or I digitalization. So, yeah, so it's operationalization of the concept of a patient-centered care. So first question to Glennis, please be concise. I, I sympathize very much. The guidelines are behind the times. And it is very difficult to persuade people to do something which is not stated on the NHS website or, or but it is stated if you go to the BSACI, British Society for Allergy and Clinical Immunology website, 
you have to search for it, but there are feeding guidelines and they put on their guidelines there, because most of this work was done in the UK, about the possibility of early feeding of allergenic foods like peanut and egg. And you can point that out as your defense if you get patients to do it and they tell you, no, 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 it's not in the guidelines. It is there in the BSACI. I think it will gradually come over into the other guidelines, but they all have a very big lag time for making major changes. Uh, Razi, I wanted to ask you, I mean, this question of the personalized care, patient-centered care, how this translates in practice? I mean, you are from WHO, so you have a global overview. So what do you think? So when we have guidelines, be it WHO or the regional office or from sustainable development agenda, these are frameworks to help governments prepare their uh, guidelines, their strategies, their policies based on evidence that is available out there. But when we come to operational approaches on how do we do the service delivery, it is based on context. But then there are certain principles of those service delivery. That's why when we look at UHC as a, uh, a framework and PHC as one of the drivers to attain universal coverage, so primary health care actually becomes a gateway. So that when person and that person centered care is having those bi directional linkages. So if a person is coming to a, a hypertension clinic saying I have headache, the person may also have skin allergy, the person may also have other diseases. So it's to have that integrated approaches and integrated care pathways and having standard guidelines and protocols and then training of the health workers so that they are able to respond to the needs of the person and not just because you will require specialized clinic because that is about the referral care pathways you have the primary care which is kind of a gatekeeper role person comes in you take all that you decide what can be taken care of at the primary care level then refer up in terms of what are the specific needs of that particular person and then once that management has happened also a step down referral because not everything has to be taken care at a secondary tertiary care because it's very expensive come back to primary care but then also link to community-based settings so that there's so much that can happen at community at family level so that's about having that implementation framework for operationalization of the guidelines that have been developed thank I you Razia, because this is pointing i mean reminds me of one concept i mean many of those principles that we have been discussing today are already in the Almata Declaration 1978 Absolutely. on primary health care. The problem is always that the discrepancy or the distance between these, these principles, which are still very valid, and the practice, which privileges tertiary care, very sophisticated things. Uh, now we have all these uh, tools of personalized medicine. Everything is fine, but I mean, the basic primary health care is still the, the, the basis for providing uh, personalized care, really, or uh, patient-centered and so forth. And in many countries, this is not uh, happening. And the uh, United States is one of them, where you, know, you have all this investment in very sophisticated things, but then, and in fact, you have 18% cost, and the uh, life expectancy is very bad. I mean, so that's, just to conclude, we have one, two minutes. I wanted to ask Matthias one thing. Uh, we did, you discuss about the ratio between cost outcome and I mean, what, what is the actual cost of these uh, diseases? I mean, uh, more specifically, I made a, a very generic uh, yeah. statement at the beginning, but uh, I don't name a number now to any of you, <laughs> uh, but uh, the principle is important. And so cost refers to the disease burden and disease burden is not just a sing single number, but it's the totality of the negative impact of any disease, including comorbidity that we were discussing. And I want to make a, a very important point, and this is that uh, many of the metrics for uh, assessing disease burden do not fit. And this is a part, and particularly uh, true for the global disease burden metrics, because mm -hmm. they reduce the overall burden to a crude uh, uh, equation, uh, adding mortality and uh, disability adjusted life years. And those disease weights, which are the basis for this, are highly unfair to people with chronic diseases. There's even a higher disease weight for pharyngitis than for atopic dermatitis. And this cannot be true. Uh, true. And if you expand this to the number of people affected, then you get completely false numbers. So in other words, don't reduce uh, disease burden as a conception 
to such single values, uh, but rather integrate uh, all the areas where people uh, suffer burden. And then you can add, of course, the costs uh, from uh, the single areas, though a large part of this is intangible costs. It's costs mm -hmm. that we cannot measure with monetary values because uh, somebody suffering, uh, well, it's not the money that is important, but his suffering. Mm -hmm. So uh, if we want to add the, the costs, we differentiate between direct costs, uh, which uh, derive from treatment, indirect costs, which apply to society and uh, uh, losses of productivity, and then the big field of intangible costs, the real suffering of the patients. And uh, this uh, has a very particular methodology and uh, no single number. Okay. Thank you, Matthias. It's uh, 10.30, so I would, uh, should uh, draw some conclusions. I have no time, so I just would like to <laughs> say that we learned a lot today, and I would like to invite you to congratulate all these, uh, uh, the speaker, Razia, Matthias, Glenis, and Tonya with a warm applause. Thank you. Thank you.